You are very gracious. And so, uh, delight to be back with you. I'm in Psalm 83. We've been looking at the book of Psalms and have tried to say that the book of Psalms needs to be interpreted in light of the whole context of the book, not as isolated Psalms, helter-skelter in a hodgepodge, but with a flow and a structural argument that takes us all the way through to the Hallelujah Psalms, which uh, uh, concludes the, the book. So here in this section, book three, where I've landed, it really talks about the devastation. We had confrontation in book one. We had communication in book two. I didn't have time to really uh, develop that. Uh, especially since you have very fast clocks here in Dallas, <laughs> and they just whiz by. Uh, seemed like uh, hardly a minute. But at any rate, I want to pick up uh, now this book in book three, which has international uh, confederation, alliances of nations now coming against Israel. I'm going to try to stick pretty close to the text so that I can get uh, possibly close to getting through. Psalm 83 was the final psalm of 12 psalms by Asaph. Uh, and uh, that was part of the collection of the 17 psalms that make up uh, book 3. Except Psalm 50 uh, was part of the 12 of Asaph. Actually, Psalm 83 does not indicate when it will be fulfilled. But for example, there's no formula in this text, the latter days, in that day, that day, which is generally our signal that it's talking about a future time. Uh, but it is clear that the motivation for this attack in this psalm, uh, uh, the motivation uh, uh, for the attack on Israel found in Psalm 83, verse 4, are the words of bravado that can still be heard in our own day with uh, increasing shrillness and hostility toward the nation of Israel. These words are, verse 4, Come, they say, let us destroy the Israelites as a nation so that Israel's name will be remembered no more. That's contemporary. It's very contemporary. But well, what is noticeable in this case is the fact that the enemy is no longer a single or individual nation that is bent on attacking Israel, as was commonly in Book 1 and Book 2. And for the most part, in most of the conflict in the Middle East. But it is now a coalition of 10 Arab nations that have banded together, not just for the defeat of Israel, but for her complete extermination. In Psalm 83, ten nations, all which closely surround the territory occupied by Israel, band together with the unified purpose of eradicating the whole nation of Israel so that her name will be remembered no more. And so that uh, these nations can occupy what Israel once held as her own territory. There's something else that is unusual in Psalm 83. The editor or collector of these seven Psalms, which is the heart of Book 3, uh, not only featured the unusual teaming up of the nations in a hostile alliance, against the people of God. But this psalm addresses the uh, redemptive work that God would accomplish, not just for the northern ten tribes or the southern two tribes of uh, Judah and Benjamin. Rather, this deliverance was for the two patriarchal figures mentioned as long as ago as from the book of Genesis, Joseph and Jacob who by the time of the psalmist in uh, Psalm 83 had already 
for several centuries been separated from each other since 931 BC when the kingdom, you remember, divided into two separate nations. But Psalm 83, in Psalm 83, they were challenged to recall the magnificent deliverance these two kingdoms had experienced uh, uh, now as one nation from the bondage under the greatest and most powerful nations in the world. For example, Israel, uh, excuse me, Egypt. This would become the basis for their hope in a second similar magnificent deliverance in the future as the uh, impending invasion of 10 foreign nations threatened them this time with literal extinction. Could this then be the final Arab-Israeli war that was mentioned also in Isaiah 17, in which Damascus and Syria were finally destroyed. As you know, if you were here earlier, I did put a caveat. I'm not a prophet. I don't have the prophetic, you know the rest of it. But at any rate, uh, I, I, I work for a nonprofit organization. So uh, at any rate, this did not appear to be part of the Russian-Iranian war of Gog Magog, that's Ezekiel 38, 39. That's coming too. Nor did it seem to fit the invasion of Israel in the campaign of Armageddon in Revelation 19. If you're in Bible study fellowship, that lesson's coming up. Uh, for none of the nations mentioned in Psalm 83 appear either in Gog Magog or in the list of nations in Armageddon. So this seems to be a third final great war. Psalm 83 describes a nation encircled by unholy alliance of 10 Arab nations that have banded together by their common goal of destroying and doing away with Israel once and for all. The earliest explanation of this psalm being fulfilled uh, is uh, uh, attached to Second Chronicles 20, where King Jehoshaphat of uh, Judah faced uh, at least a trio of nations that was headed up by Moab and Ammon and included in uh, uh, Edom, the, the uh, children of Lot, which, by the way, is one of the great revival texts of the Bible which is also pertinent for our day. Uh, I still think, uh, uh, here, let me have a ministry with you. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. if my people, and I was in a conference with my good friend Erwin, and he said, Walter, that's Israel. I said, yes, but then it goes on to say, comma, which are called by my name, comma, that is an appositional clause which defines my people. If my people, I mean, and I quoted it which, because that's King James. As I told you, I was raised on King James, so I'm bilingual. But at <laughs> any rate, uh, uh, it says, if my people, I mean all those whom I've called my name over. That occurs in the Old Testament, that occurs in the New Testament. They belong to the Lord. Will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. What land? Well, certainly Israel, but USA too. USA too. Well, that's a whole nother story. Uh, but I couldn't resist. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, this uh, contest and saying that Psalm 83 is fulfilled in Second Chronicles doesn't fit because there's only a trio of nations there that they face, not ten. So it doesn't fit. A second suggestion, going back to the days of Theodore of Mopsuestua and Diodorus, assigns this Psalm the first Maccabees 5, non-biblical book, but nevertheless seems 
good history. But once again, while it is true that the neighboring nations were hostile, there's no evidence of a league, an alliance that was formed at that particular time. And neither Adam nor the sons of Lot were the major opponents in that contest either. So a third view says that this psalm was fulfilled in the days of Nehemiah. You have Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite uh, and uh, uh, Geshem uh, who was an Arab and the Ashdodites, but they're not the ten nations. Uh, as you know, reading in the uh, nations, uh, there are either six, seven, ten, or eleven, uh, where you have the, uh, um, uh, the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Amorites and so forth. I was preaching on this years ago, and my granddaughter, uh, one of uh, uh, four granddaughters, was present at the meeting, she was only about six or seven, and afterwards she said, Granddad, you know all those ites you were talking about? I said, yes, honey. She said, you missed one. I said, I did, what? And she said, the 90 nights. So I've <laughs> added them uh, uh, to uh, sort of fill out the uh, ites, and you may want to put that in your Bible too. Well. Uh, the, what about this Ten Nation League? This psalm is one of the imprecatory psalms, psalm of cursing. It prays to God for his intervention against this alliance of nations that have banded together for the sole purpose of eliminating Israel as a nation from the face of the earth. As such, it is a national lament. The psalmist prays that the enemies of the Lord may be shamed for their ambitions and that they instead may seek the name of Yahweh. Always the gospel is a clear objective. Yeah, even in the Old Testament. Yeah, people ask me when I come, you're not, are you going to speak on the Old Testament? And they hold it for four beats. Uh, <laughs> And of course I am. So this psalm could be classified as a war oracle with elements of prayer, lament, and uh, imprecation on the enemies that threaten her very existence. Listen to how it begins. O oh God, use the name Elohim. O oh Elohim, do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Do not stand aloof. O oh God, El this time. Not Elohim, El, the shortened form. See how your enemies growl, how their foes rear their heads. With cunning, they conspire against your people. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation so that Israel's name will be remembered no more. That's what they say. Surely this is a prayer address to our Lord, but it also has the marks of a prophecy as well. So the poet prays that God would not remain detached as an onlooker while major destruction is threatened against the people of Israel. Moreover, Israel's foes are also God's foes, for they are directly said to be, in verse 2 here, your enemies. These nations have made a secret agreement amongst themselves to totally wipe out the nation Israel so that they will no longer be a people or a nation. These hostile nations hate God as much as they hate the people of God. Therein lies their intransigence and their determination. So the reason for the bitter enmity against Israel has its roots in matters that are more concerned 
uh, are more of a concern than the policies and issues that arise from time to time between Israel and some relatives of the Jewish people. Rather, here was an issue that went all the way back to the promise made to Abraham in Genesis 12, uh, 1 through 3, and in verse 7. This conflict was not a disagreement that could be settled by some sort of compromise on the human level, for it involved an ever, ever, there goes that word again, I got stuck, ever, ever, everlasting promise that had been made by God to Abraham and his offspring. The kingdom of darkness had from time to time come in opposition against Israel through such mortal rulers as Pharaoh, Alexander the Great, Sennacherib, Nebuchadnezzar, but up to the point in this psalm, there had been no concerted effort to eradicate Israel off the face of the earth. The fact that God had chosen Israel to be his means of spreading the good news to all mankind, and that he had set aside some of the most highly contested real estate on planet earth, right where three continents come together, Africa, Asia, and Europe, as well as where East meets West. And he put a sea in between two of the continents, which is called between the land, Mediterranean, Mediterranean. Uh, so, and that's the home he gave to his chosen people. This was then the thorn in the side of the nations and the peoples of the globe. The fact that in the case of Psalm 83, most of the peoples were close relatives of the descendants of Abraham made the hostility all the more intense. Two Hebrew words for God, Elohim and El, occur right at the beginning in verse one. These dual names for God form an inclusion with the two names for God that appear in verse 18, Yahweh and Most High. So Elohim and El at the beginning, Yahweh and Most High at the concluding verse. There can be no doubt here, the psalmist's prayer is to the one and only true God, for there's no one else to turn to in light of the seriousness of the threats facing Israel. Then, and now I'm going to say today, today, these anti-Semitic nations are all astir, that's the verb used in verse 2, like the waves of the sea roaring and foaming with a huge sense of overconfidence as they rear their heads as the wave comes to the top in the success that they keep on plotting the sudden demise of Israel. They keep gathering together craftily in secret in order to conspire as one solid force in carrying out a holocaust against God's people here, they call them your people uh, in this prayer. So the spirit of agitation exhibited here is the same as was seen in the Tower of Babel, uh, where the people rallied together saying, quote, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to heaven so that we may make a name for ourselves, Genesis 11. So just as these tower builders strove to achieve autonomy in their day so that they could get a name recognition, God said he would bless Israel, make them a nation, and give them a name, Shem, a name. So in Genesis 6, 4, the sons of God come to the daughters of men and they want to make what? A name for themselves. And in Genesis 11, 4, they want to build this tower so that they can have a name 
a reputation. Name theology, name, name, Genesis 12, 2, uh, Genesis 6, 4, Genesis 11, 4. It ties together. Uh, so that was their objective, to get freedom and sovereignty that would make them look like gods. So the Ten Nation Coalition uh, comes together, verses 5 through 8, if you're following in the text. Suddenly, the nations that have rarely gotten along together or seldom found that they were one mind on any major issue come together in an alliance. What's the Hebrew word for alliance? Bari, which we usually translate a covenant. But here it's a treaty of confederacy in war. They made this alliance against whom? The Lord. That is also how they got such solidarity. Verse 5, they came together with one mind. Very unusual. Matter of fact, it hardly has ever happened in the Arab community. So they got together on a common enemy. The psalmist listed ten nations that hated the Lord, and therefore they hated uh, Israel. At the head of the list came Edom, here called by the poetic phrase, the tents of Edom, verse 6. Some might assume that the Edomites uh, dwelt in tents, but instead it was an expression that was used for the nation as a whole. The Edomites were descendants of Esau, Jacob's twin brother, who settled in the hill country of Seir, an area south of Israel's Negev, in the mountains on the west side of the Arabah, south of the Dead Sea. Associated with the Edomites were the Ishmaelites, who were descendants of Ishmael, of course, the son of Hagar and Abraham. And the term Ishmaelite may serve as a general term for the Bedouin tribes who lived in tents and were those who often invaded Israel from the south. These semi-nomads made their living off such caravan routes as that of the Midianites to which Joseph was sold, you remember. So Moab was another conspirator in this alliance who often manifested the virile hostility to Judah. Along with Moab were the Ammonites, who were descendants of Lot. And the book of Judges presents the Ammonites as troublemakers in the Transjordan area, a Jephthah's judgeship came up against the Ammonites, Judges 11. Later, during the days of King Saul, he led an army in rescuing the people in uh, Jabesh, uh, Gilead, uh, from the threats of uh, Nahash. Nahash, I guess he was called Snaky, the Ammonite, for 1 Samuel uh, 11. Some of my jokes are in Hebrew. So, uh, <laughs> earlier... Earlier, Balak, the king of Moab, had tried to get Balaam to curse Israel. You know that story. That, that's a beautiful story. Uh, Numbers uh, 23, 24, with the great prophecy of Messiah. But here, Balaam wasn't supposed to go. He is the exception to the rule. He, he looks like a Gentile. Uh, up on the small Mesopotamia between the Balak and the Habor rivers that empty into the Euphrates. Euphrates is easy to remember uh, uh, because it's Euphrates which is on the west. So you have Euphrates for west. Easy to remember. And then there's the Tigris which is on the east. So you won't get east and west uh, mixed up. Okay, so here they go along, uh, and he joins in. They're all in their academic robes, representing government, a long line of donkeys, and our prophet, who is the speaker for the occasion, is also there. 
uh, and all of a sudden his donkey goes off into the weeds and he starts beating on the things, saying stuff, although it's, it's not in the Bible, but I imagine he didn't learn them in Sunday school. Uh, and he's talking to this donkey and then the second time it smashes his foot up against the wall Woo! does he let out a yelp brings everyone up off their saddle uh, and then third time it just sits down under him uh, and he lets the donkey have it and the donkey says to him am I not your donkey on whom you've been riding now I ask you if your donkey said that to you <laughs> What would you say? Uh, I guess, beg your pardon, you know, something like that. But he is so mad, he said, uh, uh, yeah, you're the same donkey, you know. And, and the text is clear. The Lord, op this is not animal speaking, this is not a folk tale. This is the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. Um, so as you teach that passage, have a little bit of background music. Uh, because they're out in the desert and they're kind of plodding along. Uh, uh, maybe Grand Canyon Sweet. Dun dee dun dee dee dun dee dun dee dun. dun, dun, dun. Uh, Patrick's not here, he's the only one to appreciate that. But at any rate, um, that would be a great uh, help for us to uh, see the background. Well, at any rate, uh, that was Moab. And then there are the uh, Hagrites. Verse six, they're known to us from Assyrian epigraphic materials. They were a nomadic tribe, lived east of the Jordan. Likewise, uh, Gebal, verse seven, somewhat questionable, but Father Mitchell de Hood was probably correct in linking it to Byblos and the city of Tyre, a close Phoenician neighbor is listed. And another nomadic tribe, Amalek, descended from Esau, fought against Israel during the wilderness wanderings, and joined the Midianites in their attack on Israel. And King Saul had tried to destroy them, but many survived. And then the Philistines also were mentioned in the Gaza Strip, for they were a constant thorn in the side of Israel. And finally, Assyria is listed, but they'd come to their end in 611 BC with the fall of Nineveh. Thus, this name may have been merely symbolic here, but surely God will not sit idly by and allow this Arab confederacy of 10 nations to eliminate Israel. Surely the Lord had promised this uh, uh, prophet Amos that he would do nothing unless he revealed his secret to his servants, the prophets, Amos 3, 7. So let's go to the imprecation that falls now on these enemies, verses 9 through 17. One could expect that God would uh, uh, do in the future uh, just as he had done in the past. Verses 9, 10, 11, and 12 set up a reminder of the great acts of God in the past. The first evidence of how God has worked previously in history is from Gideon's victory over the Midianites. Gideon's 300 men, remember how he reduced them. Now they're down to 300. They were armed merely with trumpets, jars, and torches. Very economical way to support a military. Uh, uh, and so uh, that's in Judges 7. And King Jabin, who was king in Canaan and ruled over Israel from the mighty city of Hatzor, uh, uh, was served uh, by his commander Sisera. And they were armed with 900 chariots of iron Whoa, and he's got what? Clay pots. To what? Throw at the chariots? Uh, 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 and thus, they were able, these uh, people uh, with Sisera as their commander, to oppress the Israelites for 20 years, Judges 4. But God used the woman, Debbie. I feel like I know her. Uh, 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 and a reluctant judge, Barak who said, I'll go if you go, Debbie. So he hung on to her slip. 
uh, as they go into battle. Uh, and uh, you remember, God sent a rainstorm, and the little brook of Kishon overflowed, so they lost the advantage of the chariots as they got mired down. And then uh, Sisera went running and went to a tent where Jael was there, you remember. And she said, turn in here. <laughs> he turned in, and she went out and got a peg, tent pin, and sang Peg of My Heart as she <laughs> nailed him down. Well, I'm just checking your Bible knowledge. Uh, the other victory mentioned here was the one by Gideon. He overcame four chiefs of the Midianites, Arab, Zeb, Zeba, Zalmunna. That's verse 11 of Psalm 83. And Judges 6, 7, and 8. And at the base of Mount Tabor, Mount Tabor is that one off from Mount Carmel. It's perfectly shaped. It looks like a DQ, like a Dairy Queen. Everything except the little swirl on top. So you can pick that mountain out very easily. But at the foot of it was this city, Endor. Not mentioned in Judges, but mentioned here. Well, these four chiefs, one after another, you remember, uh, uh, Gideon took uh, care of them. So the psalmist continued to imprecate this Arab league, verse 13, 14, and 15, and 16, and he likened the 10 enemies listed in the psalm to tumbleweed. Tumbleweed, a plant in the artichoke family, which has wheel-shaped stems, and hence its name in Hebrew, uh, gal gal, which means wheel. So some translate this metaphor as whirling dust. But the point is, their lot is also likened to chaff, which the wind drives away. So little doubt remain when verse 14 asks God to act as fire that would set the forest and its undergrowth all ablaze. The request was that God would pursue them and terrify them in this storm, verse 15. This prayer of cursing asked God to shake the overbearing confidence that they exhibited as they boastfully declared that they would rid themselves of the name of Israel and the presence of Israel forever, verse 4. So in place of such bold innuendo, the prayer of the psalmist was that God would convert their pride and boasting into their shame. Verse 17. So let's come to the conclusion, verse 17 and 18. The enemy's realization that the Lord Yahweh is Lord over all. It's the implication that began in verse 9 now ends. And the names for God in verse 1, Elohim and El, now appear in this inclusio, this bracketing, uh, in verse 12 as Yahweh and Most High. The psalmist's prayer ends with a desire that Yahweh would confound these scheming Arab nations who in their actions actually oppose God himself. And then they oppose his chosen people. But he also prays that these same nations may come to know that God's name is the Lord. They need to come to a personal relationship with the Lord and not just be aware that he is God by virtue of common grace to all creatures on earth. The name of the Lord will be the source of their forgiveness and the extension of his grace and mercy to all who will come to him by faith. And by the way, one of the great things that's happening in our day is that uh, former uh, Muslims who put their faith in uh, uh, Muhammad uh, are now having visions of Jesus and they go looking for a book 
They know there's a book. And they find Matthew and Mark and Luke and read it. And they say, that's the one I saw in my dream. How many? The guesstimates are as high as two million. Amazing. Amazing. Conclusion. Beautiful word. Most wait for that word in sermons. Uh, it doesn't always mean the same thing, finally, but that's only for that point. But this is the real deal. So the rallying cry of hostility from these ten nations is being heard today more clearly and with more determination in our modern era. There is a concerted effort in 2016 to, quote, destroy Israel as a nation, end of quote, and to eliminate them so that, quote, Israel's name is remembered no more, end of quote, verse 4. Even though this is presented as an attack against Israel, it must be remembered, ultimately, it's an assault against the character and the promise that God made to the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if these nations can exterminate the name and the people of Israel, then the covenant-making God can no longer be proclaimed as the covenant-keeping God. If there's a character flaw in God in this matter, then the God of all believers worldwide would be exposed as unable to do what he said he would do in every other area as well. Clearly, in this psalm, the enemies of Israel are presented as the enemies of God. And as best I can tell, and I warn you, I'm not a prophet, but the nations bordering Israel right now, in the fuss that's going on in Syria and in Lebanon and in Tyre, and in Biblos, and in Damascus, and in Jordan, and in the Hamas, and in the Gaza Strip, and uh, even whatever Assyria stands for, uh, that's where we are at this moment. I expect, in the providence of God, that this psalm may be fulfilled in our day. And that, accordingly, the best offensive against our Lord is not uh, uh, offensive if you're going to try to attack the Lord, not a philosophy of atheism or similar academic probes, but the most insidious of all offensive against gods is the one directed against the promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God put it right down here in the nitty-gritty so that the people come from Missouri can say, I saw it, I felt it, I touched it, I tasted it. Uh, so this battle may well be one of the next offenses against Israel. On the news tonight, maybe. Uh, ready to take place at any moment. But it will end in a tragic complete vanquishing of these ten nations. And the territory that they held will now be taken over by Israel to plant settlements for the host of six, seven, eight more million Jewish people that are returning to the land. And in which, all of a sudden, Israel gets jealous like it says in Romans 9, 10, uh, and 11, and said, hey, wait a minute, you Gentiles. That's our Jesus. He's Jewish. And we want him back. We're going to put our full trust in him. So as you pastor your churches, remember, you'll probably do a series very quickly on Book of Romans. Okay, but Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Christ, for it is the power, dynamite, dunamis, we say, of God to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. How does your missionary budget look? First, 
Oh, not at all. Well, next week, David Brickner will be here on Tuesday. Confess your sins. Uh, <laughs> because God is going to do a great work. Thank you for the opportunity of sharing it, but I'm excited. To, I mean, you say, what in the world's wrong with that speaker today? Well, I can't give this to you in a dull fashion. And Isaiah 63 says, blah, blah, blah. Uh, come on. It is the power of God, and God is about ready to act once more. And the contestants are lined up. Our God is an awesome God. We sing it, we do you see it uh, happening in reality. Thank you for the extra time, let's pray. Thank you, our Heavenly Father. Lead on, your King of kings and Lord of lords. Do magnificently, even as you have promised in your word. So therefore, for that same power and for that same ability, You've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. So as Paul told Timothy, so we would encourage our own hearts this day. Help us as we complete the task of preparing. And then, Lord Jesus, may we preach your word with all the passion, with all the force, and with everything that it's within us. Praise be to your great name, for it's in that majestic name we pray. Amen. 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 Lord bless you.